So I will get started then. Uh, good morning. Like I said before, my name is John Paul Rodriguez. I chair the UCN Speech Survival Commission I'm based in Caracas, in Venezuela, where I also am a professor of ecology at the Venezuelan Institute for Scientific Investigation and uh, the president of Provita, which is an UCN member organization focused on species and ecosystem conservation in Venezuela. Naomi, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Naomi de Andrade, the executive director of, of the SSC Church Office. I'm also based in Caracas, Venezuela, with part of the team. It's nice to see you all. Great. It's really, it's really wonderful to be here to participate in the in the UN General Assembly, in the Science Summit of the UN General Assembly. We're delighted to be able to join you. Thank you so much, Eric, for the opportunity. We look forward to many uh, future repeats of this event. So to begin, so we'll, we'll talk to you about the, the title, let me just go back one. The title of the presentation is Reverse the Red, and it's focused on mobilizing national networks of experts to support species conservation. Pretty much in the context uh, for us, we'll be speaking for from the perspective of the UCN Species Survival Commission, um, but there are many other partners involved in other organizations as well, and Naomi will tell you a little bit about that. But before we get into the into the reverse the red, I wanted to share with you what I see as my primary motivation for doing this and for doing most of the work that I do, frankly, in conservation, which is what we call the biodiversity paradox. There, in the screen, you can see four graphs uh, for, for images. The, the top left is the number of bird species per country around the world. On the, on the right is the number of experts um, according to the membership in the IUCN commissions, and I'll explain that in a second. And the bottom left is the number of IUCN member organizations, and the bottom right is the per capita GDP of those countries. Maybe in the next graph you can see this, in the next table you can see this more clearly. This, these four columns on your screen represent the four maps that I showed you uh, in the previous slide. The first column is the top 15 countries in terms of number of bird species. The second column is the top 15 countries in terms of IUCN commission members. The third column is the top 15 countries in terms of IUCN institutional members, the members of the union. And on the right is the uh, top 15 countries in terms of per capita GDP. What you can see really rapidly here is there are only four countries from column one present in column two and column three, and that's India, Brazil, China, and Mexico. And there are zero countries from column one present in column four. This uh, figure brings that point home. The countries in red are the 15 top countries in terms of bird species diversity, and the, and the countries in green are the top 15 countries in terms of per capita GDP. There is zero overlap between the two. Zero countries in column one are present in column four. And that is a big challenge, the big context, the framework of the work that we do. We're trying to build capacity and support biodiversity conservation, evidence-based biodiversity conservation in countries where biodiversity is highest and human and financial resources are lowest. That's our challenge. Now, how do we do this and, and what's the vision from the IUCN membership? Well, IUCN, you know, you hear International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And the question is, you know, who is united by IUCN? Who, 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 who does it unite? And the, the first pillar of the union are the members. The members are organizations. You can see there on the left, we have about 1,450 organizations. Uh, it's a very unique forum because you can join the union as a state member, as a government of a country. You can go in, join the union as a governmental agency, so just a fraction. You can also join it as a subnational government. That's a new membership category, very interesting, allowing for states, municipalities, cities to jo join the union as a, as a member. Then we have the civil society represented in NGOs, indigenous people and affiliates. So it's a really special, very special forum. The second pillar is a secretariat, which is the professional staff, a large proportion of them based in Switzerland, in Glan, that's near Geneva, that's where the headquarters of IUCN are, but they're also in, in many other countries, um, in about 50 more countries. 
And then the group that, that I'm representing here is the commissions. Uh, I chair the Species Survival Commission, but all in all, there are about 13,000 members of the commission. These are all volunteers. These are experts that contribute their time and their expertise uh, voluntarily to the IUCN uh, from 173 states. You can see there that there are more members of commissions than members of the union. So we have a wide ranging network that includes species, like I said, is the first the, the commission that I represent. But then there's the World Commission on Protected Areas, the Commission on Education and Communication, the World Commission on Environmental Law, the Commission on Ecological, Environmental uh, and Social Policy, and the Commission on Ecosystem Management. These are a vast network all over the world, uh, freely contributing their expertise and their knowledge to the union. Perhaps the, the product that we are better known for as IUCN and the commissions are the knowledge products. And these are here on the screen, on the top left, um, the red list of threatened species, which is uh, the brainchild of the Species Survival Commission. At the bottom left is Protected Planet, a world database uh, of protected areas, which is a, a joint uh, product of UNEP WCMC, the World Conservation Monitoring Center, and the World Commission on Protected Areas. WCPA and SSC, um, together we have produced the key biodiversity areas standard, which um, is a joint knowledge product. At the top right, you'll see the red list of ecosystems uh, driven by the Commission on Ecosystem Management. And down at the bottom, a couple of other knowledge products driven by CISP, the Natural Resource Governance Framework and People and Nature, which look both at how, how a society um, governs natural resource use, but also how uh, we depend on such resources. Now, in addition to these global level standards, uh, many, many countries around the world have developed red list of species of ecosystem at the national level. You can see there on the screen just a, a simple snapshot of the reach of the red list of ecosystems and the countries, both um, ecosystems in particular, both uh, terrestrial and marine regions that have been assessed. In the case of species, uh, we are focused on the countries uh, specifically. But you can see over 100 countries around the world have produced national red list and are very important in national conservation policy. Now, just a couple of words about three of these knowledge products, just to set the stage a little bit in more detail. Well, the red list of threatened species has a very peculiar characteristic of not being a list and not being about threatened species, although that's what the name of it is. It really is a fantastic resource with a vast amount of information on um, on uh, almost 150,000 species. Uh, about 28% of them are threatened. We call threatened species those on the three categories on the left, critically endangered, endangered, and vulnerable. Those three together are collectively referred to in IUCN as threatened, and their categories are assigned in a kind of rigorous uh, scientific process. And you can see on the left there, uh, the scale of extinction risk level, which goes from least concern to critically endangered. Uh, it's an increasing uh, level of risk, and that's a fundamental characteristic of the UCN Red List of Threatened Species, that these categories reflect a lot of information about their status and their change in distribution and abundance over time. The Red List of Ecosystems um, is another uh, tool that was inspired originally in the Red List of Threatened Species, and now has a life of its own. We use the term risk of collapse instead of risk of, risk of extinction in the case of ecosystems, because ecosystems don't go extinct in the same way that a species does. But something that I wanted to highlight in this slide is the global typology, ecosystem typology of the IUCN published a couple of years ago. This is a fantastic resource which classifies all the ecosystems in the world, marine, freshwater, terrestrial, and subterranean, into a, a hierarchical um, nested uh, classification, very useful, the same way that species are classified. This didn't exist until it was developed by this team of the UCN Commission on Ecosystem Management. And uh, I invite you to look at it because it's a very important resource that we're trying to roll out around the world. And the KBAs, which is a way that the, the information captured by the list of species and ecosystems is then used for um, uh, designating areas of 
inordinate importance for biodiversity conservation. So taking the, the data and identifying sites, it's a very important tool that has reached, reached uh, many important players around the world. Now, for me, the key, the key aspect of these knowledge products is how do we use this information in an integrated way? So imagine a, a, a database that includes all of the species in the red list of threatened species, all of the ecosystems in the red list of ecosystems, both at the global and the national level. If on top of that database, we place protected planets, so all the data that we have on, um, on, on um, protected areas and in, in conserved areas around the world. And on top of that, we, we place the KVAs. These are all data, data sets that are, it's possible to integrate them. It is not a big challenge technologically. It is mostly a challenge logistically and socially. And by socially, I mean, bringing together all the groups uh, of people involved in these different knowledge products and, and having them work together. So that's a challenge that I see ahead of us. And that's what I've been trying to focus on, focus my time in bringing together the, the information on species, ecosystems, protected areas at the national and the global level. Now, coming back to close, uh, the, I think this is the one of my last slides to close this section. Uh, I wanted to highlight that of the three pillars of the UCM, we usually have a strong interaction between the commissions and the secretariat. It tends to be a fairly good uh, collaboration with a, a seamless communication between the two in most of the cases, but we don't have such great uh, relation between the commissions and the UCM member organization. And part of the reason that we're here at the United Nations General Assembly Science Summit is to, is to build bridges with the uh, IUCN membership, the countries, the government organizations, the government agencies, because we see that work conservation uh, takes place. Oh no, I'm not, I'm not done yet. I have a couple more slides, sorry. So just to, to close, I wanted to close uh, for this first part with what we call the species conservation cycle. All the work that we do at the IUCN species uh, survive uh, uh, the, the species survival commission. Sorry, I can't for, believe I forgot their own name. Uh, falls within the species conservation cycle, which has three consecutive stages: assess, plan, act, and two underlying, um, overarching components, which are network and communicating. Now, the red list is our primary, the primary way that we do assessments in the SSC. Then we have the conservation planning specialist group which develops all the methods for taking the information on the red list and transforming that into action plans. Then we, we convene the donors such as here, Nat, Nat Geo and Fundacion Segret to finance the, the plans developed by the, by, by the team. And this is the, the perfect cycle where we have assessments then followed by planning action, and then we go back to assessment after action takes place. Now, what we see when we do these, these analyses is that the red list is a global assessment of the risk of extinction of species, while uh, most of the conservation action happens at the national level. So that's why in my previous slide where I was showing, I was showing that there was a weak point between SSC and IUCN members. This slide in front of you now reinforces that point that our, our role in, um, in improving the status of species uh, is key to engage at the local level with national and regional governments. So uh, th that's the main one of the main purposes of us participating in this event is to develop stronger relationships with all the, the countries that are part of the UN and the various biodiversity conventions. So now over to Naomi, who will talk to you about reverse the red, and then I'll come back at the end with, uh, with something else. Thank, Thank you, you Jean Paul. Well, as you mentioned, uh, we, we are focused on how, how we can uh, strengthen the, the local capacity. Um, oh, sorry. Do you stop sharing? Perfect. It's now there. Thank you. So reverse the red is, is the, this global movement that ignites strategic action and optimists to ensure the survival of species by reversing negative trends shown on the IUCN red list. So we can, we are looking for ways in which we can provide these tools and, and, and to, to the national experts so they can help us on this uh, main goal. Next slide, please. 
Our mission then is to unite tools and partnerships to catalyze conservation efforts at local levels and support countries in delivering the Convention of Bio Biological Diversity Targets, how we can achieve the post-2020 um, targets that are set in the in the that biodiversity framework. Our messages are that we are always optimistic, always evidence-based, always collaborative, and always diverse, inclusive, and empowering. Next slide, please. Well, we are not alone on this. We are a coalition of partners, um, of, of which uh, SSC, the Species of Survival Commission, is, is part. We are working with WASA, which is the World Association of Zoos and Aquarius, and also a producer company in the US called Tangle Bank Studios, and several, several group of, of NGOs, zoos and aquarius around the world. In, in, a, in a movement that is growing, there are others that are coming. But just to mention some of them, we wild on the edge conservation, San Diego Zoo, Colonial Zoo, Zoo Victoria. So we are a coalition that is, uh, we are putting together a strategy for us to, to achieve these goals. Next slide. What is different now? Well, the, in, in historically or, or in the past, the IK, the IK targets were adopted without a support structure for delivering by government. So now we are trying with Reverse the Red to put together a collaborative model and tools to better support governments, agencies in setting these tar targets and monitor the, the, the achievements of these targets uh, over the years. So we would like to support the effort that the, uh, to achieve the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework Species Targets. Next slide. How? We have created or developed a strategy that contains four pillars, the, the main arms of Rivers of Red. First one is mobilizing national networks, but we are also trying to empower communities, measuring impact and amplifying success. Um, the Species of Apple Commission is participating in all these four pillars or arms of Rivers of Red, but we are especially leading the mobilizing national network uh, pillar. Uh, and that's a model we, we would like to show you today. Next slide. So mobilizing national network to do what? Well, John Paul mentioned early on that uh, we are doing these activities or historically we, we have been doing these activities as S plan act globally, but the conservation action and, and all these activities happen at local level. So we would like to empower communities to assess plan act uh, at national level. That's our goal. Next slide. And with this graph, we, we wanted to show what are the actors or the stakeholders we, we, are, aim, we are aiming to engage uh, to coordinate actions at national level. As you are seeing in the heart of the, of the graph is the Assess Planet Cycle there. The, those are the activities we would like to encourage within each country. And to do that, we, we need uh, several stakeholders, all the ones that you are seeing there, uh, many others, but especially government agencies, IUCN uh, bodies within each country, museum, conservation NGOs, zoos and aquariums, and two uh, models that we, as the species of our commission, we have developed and we are contributing with Reverse the Red, which are the national species specialist groups and the national centers for species survival. In the case of the national species specialist groups, uh, these are, uh, next slide, please. These are groups of experts that are invited uh, to be part of the S of SSSC as the taxonomic or the thematic ones that we have already. But this is like a third pillar that we will, we are creating to support especially these actions at national level. The members of these groups are national experts from all biodiversity groups, reals of tens. They could be SSC members or not, and the idea is to bring more capacity of these people uh, in countries to become part of the of, of SSC. And the purpose of these groups is to coordinate expertise across taxonomic and thematic groups to support and facilitate science-based science decision-making and policies and to help and reverse the loss of the species. And the idea, of course, is to, as, as we showing the in the previous graph is that they can coordinate action between all the stakeholders that are within the country, especially uh, as much as possible with this respective IUCN National Committee and National Biodiversity Authorities. 
Um, how this is working so far? Well, we have invited a, a group of volunteers or experts uh, within a national level across diverse organizations to contribute with data, knowledge, and best practices in assessment, planning, and actions. And since early this year, we have established three groups, China, Colombia, and Madagascar. And there are other coming like Indonesia and others in South Africa. The idea is to grow with this and to provide all the tools and knowledge we, we can to this uh, group of experts and also allow them to bring more capacity, more, more um, people that is working within this country that perhaps cannot be part of SSC at global level, but they can contribute because they have the knowledge within their local communities. Next slide. These are more or less the activities you can find that you are in the term of reference of these uh, national species specialist groups. As we have mentioned before, they are oriented to implement the species conservation cycle at national level. And we, we are expecting that they can do this with the knowledge uh, products and the tools we are providing them. And the idea is that they can complete the, the whole cycle and they can <clears throat> deliver the, the targets they are achieving and also monitor and evaluate how they are achieving these activities over the time. The other model that we have created to contribute with the reverse threat is the Center for Species Survival. These are uh, organizations that are dedicated in staff team, at least one staff team that is working uh, to catalyze, assess, plan, and act priorities and partnerships to allow us to, to, to grow and to, to spread the word regarding the, the activities we are doing within each country with the specific priorities they can bring to the commission. Next slide, please. And so far, uh, we have 10 centers working around the world that, uh, with three, 30 staff members there. Uh, we are located in eight countries. We will see it uh, in a minute and um, in the five continents. So the idea is to keep grow growing with this model as well. These are partners that are working with the Species Survival Commission directly, uh, but they paid for this task and they, they staff and they help us to catalyze conservation action at national levels as well, depending on the priority that they have. We have some centers that are national, others that are regional, and others that is global. If we go to the next slide, we can see how they are distributed in, in, in around the world. We have three located in the US, the uh, in at the Albuquerque Bayou Park, one of them. The Global Center is in the Indianapolis Zoo, and we have other in <clears throat> Georgia Aquarium. We have other in Europe, like Loro Parque Fundación, eh, Oceanario de Lisboa, and Paradise eh, in United Kingdom, Paradise Wildlife Park in United Kingdom. We have other in Singapore with Monday Nature, other in Australia, the Zoos and Aquarium Association of South Australia, and others in South America, one in Fundación Temaiken, and other in Parque de Aves. There are currently like six development, one in South Africa and other in Dublin. But this is a model that is growing and is showing us that we can, you know, unify efforts for, uh, for us to work as a team, because these people is working as, as an extension of the species survival team and the species survival share of this team, and, and they are, re, are, really, are really effective in helping us to, to prioritize actions uh, within each country, because they know the priorities or they know the, the, the things that need to be done within each uh, location they are. And I think the next slide is the last one. And here we, we wanted to show the interaction between the centers and the SSC network, how this is working so far uh, within the SSC structure. We have like uh, three different pillar of type of groups within SSC. One is the geographic and the, the other is the taxonomic and the disciplinary. And for each of these, there are centers for species survival interacting with the specialist groups. Uh, and the idea is to strengthen the, the capacity of these uh, spe specialist groups to, to, to implement the things and to, to go through the species conservation cycle and to work together with the centers that we have in each country 
and also to try to decentralize the activities we are doing. We need capacity, we need funds, we need uh, staff that can help us to achieve our, our activities, our goals, or the targets that we have in, in the species strategic plan. So this is a model that is working really well so far and, and that we would like to keep growing. Um, and Reverse the Red is like the umbrella for us to, to, to bring this capacity and to work together on this. Uh, the traditional groups that we have uh, been developing within SSC are the taxonomic ones. Uh, like the amphibian, bird, reptile, fish, fungi, plants. Uh, for those uh, groups, we have the Global Center for Species Survival that is supporting them, uh, but also other taxonomic groups uh, like the New Mexico, the Portugal, and potentially others like the amphibian working group. These, work, these groups that are have been created to, to support specific activities, specific ta or, or taxonomic uh, realms. And, that they can work directly with a specialist group under the taxonomic group. There are others that are disciplinary, like the climate, check, the climate change uh, specialist group, conservation planning specialist group, et cetera. We don't have any center for species survival disciplinary uh, um, yet, but we are trying to create one of them, like the biobanking uh, specialist group, uh, center for species survival, and the idea is that they can be integrated within this uh, structure as well. And the one that is uh, relatively new is the geographic uh, spectrum of this, and is this with these national species special groups, and most of the centers that we have that are working at national level, like the Argentina uh, Center for Species of Rabio, the Macaronation in Loro Parque, the one in Paradise Wildlife Park and the others. So this is more or less a structure we have within the SSC network and how they are working. And I think I think that's the last slide and we will come back with John Paul. Yes, thank you, Naomi. That's great. Um, I'm just going, I just want to close this uh, session or this presentation with a, a message of hope. And the message of hope is because it's not just an irrational mes message of hope. It's a message, message of hope based on evidence, on the fact that deliberate, premeditated conservation action can make a difference. And uh, there are many examples of that, of species that have been recovered from severe declines because of using evidence-based scientific approaches to species recovery. And these two publications that you can see on your screen they're both from a few years ago, 2017. They both are heavily, the UCN, the SSC network of experts is heavily involved in these publications. And I invite you to look at them when you have a time uh, to do so. It is really inspiring. And I will tell you a couple of stories that I, that I read in those books uh, to share with you. We're going to start in, in Mauritius. Mauritius is an island in the in the Indian Ocean. I call it a model island because it's a model of, of extinction and of recovery. And uh, we'll see what I mean by that. The, the, the stars of the show are three species, three birds, which they were the most something, and you'll see what that means, the most of something at the time that they started. The Mauritius kestrel, is one of them, the pink pigeon and the echo parakeet. Well, the, the Mauritius kestrel in their, in their mid seventies was the rarest bird in the world. There were four kestrels left in Mauritius. One of them, one breeding pair only of the entire species. This was you know, pretty, pretty much the most hopeless that you can get in terms of conservation. And yet uh, uh, people started working on saving the species. Uh, the main threats were DDT, as you know, this, this pesticide affects the, the metabolism of calcium on eggshells, so it made the, the, egg the eggs very, very fragile, and they didn't uh, have a, in, enough nesting sites. Well, in the 1980s, uh, DDT was phased out around the world, very few places still use it. Uh, uh, intense captive breeding campaign uh, developing a technique called double clutching, which is uh, after the birds lay the first uh, eggs, the, those eggs are removed from the nest and, and hatched in an incubator, and then the birds lay a second a second set of eggs, a second nest. Uh, the, the, in, in a couple of decades, the species then increased to 250 to 300 birds 
that now live in the wild. In the 1990s, the pink pigeon was the rarest pigeon of the world. Uh, under a dozen of them left, uh, threatened by food shortage and, and egg predation and adult predation by exotic species, by invasive species. And I'll show you who they were in a second. Um, and these uh, pink pigeons, again, were also subject to a captive breeding program for, for release, uh, supplementary feeding. But the cats and mongooses that used to eat the adults and the rats that used to eat feed in the nests were controlled. And now we have about 400 birds in seven locations. Again, you know, very small number of birds uh, recovered to a decent population size. Not huge, but decent population size. The echo parakeet was the rarest parrot of the world uh, in the 1990s. Only three fem females left out of a dozen. Uh, these parrots nest on tree holes, and uh, there, there were just not enough of these nests and the native fruits for them to feed. So once again, these birds were uh, reintroduced uh, from uh, captive breeding pairs. Uh, food was supplemented, nest boxes were added. In 2017, uh, the birds went up to 650 to 700. So these are three cases of species that were just virtually extinct. You know, if we had given up and not done anything about it, they surely would be extinct. But like I said before, you know, carefully designed, deliberate and premeditated actions can have a big difference. Another species that went through a similar uh, process, a very different, this is a, a, a stick insect, uh, Lord Howe Island phasmid. Phasmid means stick insect in, in scientific speak. Well, this, this, uh, Phasmid is about the, it's about a foot long, maybe a little bit less than a foot long, like about you know, twenty five centimeters, thirty centimeters long when they're big adults. And in the nineteen eighteen, a ship ran aground at the only known site where these species lived. Within about a dozen years, the all known individuals were gone, and they was declared extinct. However. About 100 years later, maybe a little bit less than 100, about 80 years later, it was rediscovered at another little uh, island close by, about 23 kilometers. Uh, two pairs were collected of 40 individuals total that were known in the wild. And now there's a, a population, th three populations in, in zoos around the world, uh, about 13,500 individuals. And um, a species that was virtually gone, again, is also recovered and now waiting for a safe site for reintroduction. So that my message is, you know, conservation works. We know how to do conservation. We just have to do more of it. And these are just very few examples from a large collection of examples that you can find in those books and other publications. We're very happy uh, to emphasize conservation success. And that's the main purpose of Reverse the Red, to share with you examples, techniques, methods, so that we can be more effective at conservation at the national level. So thank you all for being here. We are especially grateful to all the organizations that support SSC and that allow us to do the work that we do. If you wish to reach us uh, by email, you can use our Gmail account, which is ssc.iucn at gmail.com. And Naomi and I and, and others in the team will be very happy to answer any questions you may have. So thank you, great to see you all. Uh, now we have time uh, for a few questions, if anybody has any. Thank you. Any question from the audience? You look in the audience? chat, or oh, the chat, I don't know. We just put the email address the email. in the chat, if you wish. We have uh, a few minutes left, if, we, if anybody has questions, if we don't, if you don't have questions now, that's fine too. You feel free to reach out to us by email and we'll be happy to uh, address and please share this presentation with others. We're very keen to hear what people have to say about this. Well, on my behalf, oh, there's a, a oh, oh, thank you, Eric. Uh, on, on my behalf, um, thank you so much. On behalf of SSC and Naomi as well. We have a question, John Powell, in the oh, chat. Why question. there is no centers for species survival in Africa and Asia? Uh, we're working on it. We are certainly, this is a very new initiative. It's just a couple of years old. 
uh, well, it's more than that, but it really took off about a couple of years ago. We are working well, in Asia. We have uh, Singapore and Mandai Nature, which is uh, they, they, they cover the Southeast Asia region. Um, but yes, we are working with uh, a few organizations in, in Southern Africa and in other uh, Asian parts of the in Asian countries. And we hope to have, we don't want to spoil it uh, by announcing that we have created them, but we're certainly equally concerned and wanted to work on it. Um, in the near future, we'll, we will we will bring them into the network. And what are the procedures for establishing one? Yes, so the procedure for establishing a center of species survival is uh, to have an organization willing to to uh, take the load. So like Naomi said, uh, the commitment is one staff member full-time devoted to the reverse event. And what they do, sorry, devoted to the, to the center. And what they do is that they define a series of objectives all framed within the species conservation cycle. So it could be, it could be uh, working on red list assessments. It could be working on developing action plans or implementing them, or any other component of the species conservation cycle that that uh, your organization may be interested in. And then once you've got that commitment, that interest, that willingness, then the next step is to contact Naomi and to start talking about what you would like to do and how that fits within the bigger picture. And uh, we usually the different centers have a. Uh, uh, one meeting per month with the other members of all the other centers. Uh, and together they are very synergistic and, and collaborate in developing this. So it's what you need to do above all is to want to do it and then reach out to us. And we will help you formulate the idea and implement it. Brilliant. Right. All right. Well, that's a question. I think we have a question from Eric. Oh, you do. Uh, how to make this general? Well, the best way you can I mean that you mean like like how to go beyond this presentation. Uh -huh. um, uh, do you hear me or not? Yep, we can hear you. A link, okay. yes. Yep, good. So what what I'm what I meant with that is that the questions about Africa and so on, they are, I think they are good. And, and, and this relates to the, to the general question on how to spread the, the structure and how to get easy contact because it's, it's if you are an, a newcomer in this world, then, uh, then it's not easy to get contact. And I know exactly how we got contact with you. And it was a, an intricate and elaborate way. So, uh, and this is no criticism, but it's perhaps yeah. a, a, something to reflect about. Yeah, we have some of these two strategies that Naomi mentioned, the Centers of Species Survival and the National Species Specialist Groups. Um, what we are finding in their implementation is that the centers of species survival have a tendency to be located in developed countries. And that is mainly because they have uh, strong institutions capable of investing the resources of establishing a center of species survival. So what we're trying to do in that case is to encourage the centers of species survival, the new ones, to have a, a mandate that goes beyond their region and their country. So try to have centers of species survival that despite the fact they're located in the North, they are really worried about supporting work in the South. But the, the other groups, the national species specialist groups, what we have found there is that the greatest appetite for their establishment is in developing countries because those countries see uh, building you know, capitalizing on the existing SSC network and bringing in new experts from the region as a very positive thing to do. So it's interesting because we, we didn't plan it that way, but we are certainly seeing uh, national species specialist groups, you know, like you could see China, Colombia, Madagascar, are the three that we have, and uh, a lot less interest in the developed countries because they already have structures that they use for these different um, 
uh, activities in conservation. So I think that that's the kind of the, the, the way that we are responding to this is strengthening from the SSC's perspective, the National Species Specialist, I mean, the China Specialist Group, China Species Specialist Group that was just created a few weeks ago, has about 200 members already that they have signed up uh, for AUC and people who were not part of the SSC network until two weeks ago because they didn't see themselves in that network. And what we're hoping is that by creating these different ways to engage, we will be opening the door to different kinds of collaborators and partnerships. So, so, <coughs> so I see there is another question here from Peru, but just would, for instance, I'm concerned about the great Atlantic forest. And, uh, and as, as you know, uh, my province is, is the remain, reminder, I would say, the, the largest uh, piece or largest chunk of the inner Atlantic forest which, rem which remains. Is that something which could be a, a center for species survival? Because there is a lot of people in in this yeah. unit that are specialists in the area and they could be, how to say, they could, it could be a center for regional specialists in, in, in the inner Atlantic forest area between Argentina, Paraguay and Brazil. Yeah, absolutely. Well, in fact, uh, Parque das Aves that is based in Foz Iguazu, they, uh, their main focus is birds of the Atlantic forest. Um, uh, that's the kind of theme that they are, they're also working on national red lists, uh, you know, at the national level and supporting that work uh, also. Um, and they are interested in not maybe, they don't have to be the, the like the headquarters, but they're no. very interested in promoting the National Species Specialist Group. So my suggestion would be for you to chat with them, to join forces in identifying those experts and bringing them in because they already are starting to work with us on that. And uh, like I said, they're not the owners of, of, of any of this, but they're certainly very interested and want to um, engage with others. So please, let's, let's find ways that all of you work together. Okay, that's good. And we have a, we have a session with them next uh, 27, next week. So okay, good. the fantasy, good. you can attend it. And we have other question here from Maggie. It says, what have been the bridges to convene, to convince the academy, museums, and policymakers to establish the referred conservation centers? Well, we don't have a, a, a defined method uh, to do that. We, we really want these, these um, centers to come from you, you know, come from the people interested. We don't create them in the sense that we don't go around uh, establishing them from the top down. We prefer for them to come from the bottom up. So we, the role that we see we having is to have meetings like this one, where we explain what we mean by the Centers of Species Survival and by the, the National Species Specialist Groups. And if a group of people from any country uh, become interested and are motivated to take the initiative and move it forward, then we provide all the support that we can uh, for that process. But um, we're really keen, like, like you could see on the screen that Naomi presented, all of the centers for species survival that we have now are zoos or aquariums. Uh, that, that's not a requirement, it's just a historical accident. It's organizations that we have close working relationships with and they have been very interested in, in participating. But we're keen to bring academ acad academia in uh, universities, other NGOs. So, you know, if you if you have any idea, any interest, any motivation, please reach out to us and we will be very happy to help you think, think it through and uh, see if we can come up with new ones. We certainly would love uh, to have um, more in South America. That was the last question, I think. All right, so please remember in the chat is our email address, ssc.iucn at gmail.com. And uh, please reach out to us anytime. We'll be very happy to talk to you. And thank you so much for being here with us. 
have a good day, have a good week, and uh, let's be in touch. Thank you, and thank you, thank Eric, you. so much for, for bringing us together.